Hello, this is Claire Mitchell, and on behalf of my co-presenters, Devasish Sinha and Aparna Lakaraju, I'd like to present a tutorial on lysosomes and age-related macular degeneration. This tutorial is on behalf of the Ryan Initiative for Macular Research in spring 2018. So to introduce the topic, I want to point out that the purpose of this tutorial is for us to illustrate many ways in which we think uh, lysosomal compromise can contribute to some of the pathologies we see in age-related macular degeneration. I will be focusing on basic and emerging properties of lysosomes that we think are particularly relevant for AMD. Devasish Sinha will be discussing animal models that provide clear links between lysosomal dysfunction and AMD. And Aparna Lakaraju will be discussing the cell biology of RPE cells with particular relevance to AMD. And I'd like to stress that this is a rapidly changing field with important new papers being published on a monthly basis. This tutorial is not meant to provide an in-depth coverage of every aspect, but merely to bring to your attention some of the important highlights that we think will provide a useful talking point going forward. Basic and emerging properties of lysosomes with relevance to age-related macular degeneration. Lysosomes are the primary degradative organelle in the cell. They are characterized by their low acidic pH and the presence of multiple degradative enzymes. These proteases, lipases, and others are pH sensitive and work optimally in the acid conditions. It's thought that this requirement helps protect cellular constituents in the event of lysosomal rupture because the enzymes will be unable to break down cellular material because of the higher pH. The pH inside lysosomes is primarily controlled through the actions of the vesicular hydrogen ATPase pump, which uses the energy of ATP to concentrate hydrogen ions in the lysosomal lumen. These ions are concentrated in a 100 to 1,000 fold gradient across the membrane. And in, this concentration is used for a variety of functions, including not just the degradation by acid-loving enzymes that we've talked about, but maintaining uh, gradients for other ions, uh, the membrane potential, and contributions to the fusion with endosomal and plasma membranes. I'd like to briefly just describe some of the many transporters and ion channels that have recently been identified on the lysosomal membrane. Now, this collection is pretty complex. It may not be quite as detailed as, as those found on the plasma membrane, but if you keep in mind the volume of the lysosome and the relatively reduced uh, surface area, you get the impression that this is a very tightly regulated space. And we think there are so many transporters on the membrane because regulation of luminal pH, calcium, sodium, ion concentrations is vital for lysosomal function in general. We've already talked about the vesicular proton ATPase that, that delivers protons to the lumen. Uh, we also know that this proton pump responds to levels of amino acids in the lumen and can regulate cellular energetics through this pathway. The membrane potential across the lysosomal uh, membrane into the lumen is negative minus 20 to minus 40 millivolts. This is still being resolved, but that's the, the most likely guess at the moment. 
We know that the concentration of protons and the gradient here is important in helping get rid of catabolites, particularly those breakdown products from carbohydrates and amino acids. These are exported through sodium-dependent amino acid transporters uh, through a secondary function with sodium hydrogen exchangers. This is similar to what you see in the uptake of amino acids in, in the lumen of the digestive tract. We don't think that lipids are exported through transporters, and current thinking is that most of the lipid waste is removed via vesicular exocytosis. Finally, I'd like to point out the importance of cation channels. You can see on the top right here, particularly the TRIP-ML family here. These are permeable to sodium, calcium, iron, zinc, and other cations, and we think have an important role in multiple lysosomal functions that I'll talk about at the end of this section. Now, the lysosome is needed to degrade material that's been delivered by a classic autophagy pathways. And we think about the fusion of the autophagosome with the lysosome through the macro autophagy pathway. The material is also delivered through the chaperone mediated autophagy via the receptor LAMP2. However, RPE cells have a considerably greater load than most cells because they must also degrade photoreceptor outer segment tips that are phagocytosed and delivered to the lysosome. When we think about the degradation of various different materials, we know that the degradation of protein can be accomplished by both proteasomes and lysosomes. And while communication between these two is complex, evidence suggests that if one of these is compromised, the other can pick up some of the slack. For example, if you see a compromised lysosome, you see an increased degradation of protein through the proteasome. Degradation of lipids seems to have fewer backup systems that we are aware of. And this is important because even a little bit of accumulated waste material can accumulate over many years in post mitotic cells. And if you think about the RPE cells with this intense degradative load of rather nasty lipids, soft lipids with all the disc membranes, and over many decades, we do see an accumulation of partially degraded and oxidized material accumulating as lipofusin. Lipofusin refers to accumulations of oxidized lipids from lysosomal associated organelles. Lipofusin is a classic sign of aging and reflects a defective lysosomal clearance of lipids. We can see lipofusin in a variety of cell types. You can see on the left uh, its presence in cardiac myocytes and in microglial cells. It's worth pointing out that we call it lipofusin and not protofusin for a reason, because most of this material is lipid waste product, not protein. In RPE cells, we have the addition of retinoids due to their role in degrading photoreceptor outer segment pieces. Now, the relationship between the primary retinoid A2E and accumulated lipids at different portions of the retina is complex, but it's clear that both may have a component to play in the damage that we see to these cells. It's also clear that the presence of lipofusin is a symbol, a marker for damaged lysosomes and indicates that the multiple lysosomal functions that we'll talk about later in, in this section are likely compromised as well as the degradation that leads to lipofusin. Whether or not lipofusin itself directly affects cell damage remains to be seen, 
And finally, I just want to point out that RPE cells in AMD seem to have a real problem handling lipids. In this interesting study recently from the Theos group, they took RPE cells out of donors with control and AMD and after allowing them to grow, stained them uh, with a lipid droplet stain. And you can see in the green much more of that in AMD derived eyes, uh, showing that they've got a real problem handling this lipid. Some of the strongest evidence linking lysosomal defects with age-related macular degeneration come from parallels between lysosomal storage diseases and visual defects. For example, the first clinical sign of problems in juvenile CLN3, a form of Batten's disease, is retinal degeneration. This progresses to a full blindness and then with more global symptoms. Many of these lysosomal storage diseases result from mutations in specific degradative lysosomal enzymes. Uh, for example, uh, acid sphingomyelinase defects can lead to accumulations of lipid in RPE and retinal degenerations in Neiman Pick disease. On the top of this slide, you can see uh, see images from a recent paper by Craig Crossland's group in which you see the accumulation of autofluorescence in RPE cells from wild type heterozygous and homozygous mice on the bottom. And you can see the substantial increase in autofluorescence in these cells missing acid sphingomyelinase completely. If we look at the progression of the degeneration again, you can see a problem at six months of age in the homozygote knockout mice. You can see an accumulation of material in the RPE area and damage to the photoreceptors. We also see parallels between enzymes involved in the general lysosomal function. For example, the cation channel TRIP-ML1 that we spoke about previously. These mutations can lead to mucolipidosis type 4, in which the patients lose their sight as teenagers. If we look at fibroblasts from these patients on the bottom left, you can see that they have both the increased number of lysosomes detected with lysotracker and a substantial increase in autofluorescence. And when we merge these in the yellow, you can see that the vast majority of this autofluorescence is attributable to lysosomes. Looking at a mouse model of mucolipidosis type 4, in which the TRIP-ML1 ion channel has been removed, we can see a substantial increase in the autofluorescence, specifically in the RPE cells that resemble some of the, the issues that we see with AMD. And these mice go on to form retinal degeneration. Another powerful way in which we can show parallels between lysosomal dysfunction and AMD involves chloroquine retinopathy. Chloroquine is trapped in acidic environments and raises the pH inside them and has been traditionally used as a tool to raise lysosomal pH in experiments. However, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, Paconil, have been used as a way of preventing certain diseases, both for traditional malaria use and some of the uh, inflammatory autoimmune disorders. Chloroquine retinopathy presents itself in a small proportion of these patients. The chloroquine has an affinity for melanin and tends to accumulate in RPE cells even after the treatment itself has stopped. We see that there is a parallel defect in the degeneration in chloroquine retinopathy, a relative sparing of foveal function, parafoveal dysfunction, and degeneration. 
In animal models, chloroquine can lead to incompletely degraded phagosomes with disc membranes and residual buildup in Brooks membrane. On the top image, you can see from the Mahan et al. paper 2004 that mice treated with chloroquine show photoreceptor dysfunction and substantial accumulations of undegraded material in the RPE cells. In animal models, if we treat RPE cells with chloroquine, we can see, again, a substantial increase in the number of lysosomes. So lysosomal biogenesis, increased autofluorescence, and increased levels of cholesterol in these lysosomes, as evidenced by staining with the diphilipin. This shows us that elevating lysosomal pH is itself sufficient to induce a buildup of lipofusin-like material and can cause retinal degeneration. While some of the clinical attributes of chloroquine retinopathy are distinct from what we see in AMD, there are sufficient parallels to suggest that lysosomal compromise does play a role in AMD. I'd like to now cover some of the interesting new developments associated with lysosomes that may have bearing for AMD. We've now uh, identified an interesting feedback pathway in lysosomes in which the degradation of material is low, uh, in which the elevated pH is high, or in which the proton pump, the VATPase, is turned off, we see activation of transcription factor TFEB. TFEB can translocate to the nucleus and increases transcription of a series of lysosomal proteins, autophagy proteins, and mitochondrial proteins. This lysosomal biogenesis is a way of increasing the number of lysosomes and the autophagy pathway to respond to compromised degradation. On the right, we see a slide showing a role for lysosomal compromise in activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. The NLRP3 inflammasome is increasingly recognized as playing a role in retinal diseases and general neural degeneration. And it can lead to the activation and release of uh, the master cytokine IL-1 beta. Evidence now suggests that the release of cathepsin B from ruptured lysosomes can activate the NLRP3 inflammasome on its own, suggesting that lysosomal compromise may be one pathway to lysosomal increases in inflammation in compromised RPE cells. In this slide, I'd like to highlight some of the interactions between lysosomes and mitochondria on the left and lysosomes and iron on the right that may be particularly relevant for the development of AMD. Lysosomes and mitochondria have a complex interdependence. We know that a regular supply of ATP is needed by the hydrogen pump on lysosomal membrane to keep the lysosomal lumen acidic. If mitochondria become older or sicker and decrease their output of ATP, this is going to negatively impact the lysosome and lysosomal pH can rise. The corollary is also true in that mitochondrial health is dependent on happy lysosomes. We know that the regular turnover of damaged mitochondria through a process called mitophagy is necessary for the replacement with healthy, productive mitochondria. Mitophagy requires well-functioning lysosomes. And so if there is an impairment in lysosomal function, we will see a reduction in the turnover of mitochondria and the cell will find accumulation of older, less competent mitochondria. Even a mild 
decrease in the function of either organelle or mitochondria is going to exacerbate a decline in the other, leading to a, a positive feedback in, in the decline. And we think this may well contribute to what we see in AMD. On the right, I want to highlight some of the interesting interactions between iron and H2O2 that occur in the lysosome and may have particular relevance for the formulation of lipofusin. Iron is largely stored in lysosomes in RPE cells. And the introduction of H2O2 coming from breakdown of mitochondria through mitophagy leads to a increased possibility that the Fenton reaction uh, between Fe2 and H2O2 will occur. This leads to the production of hydroxy radicals, which can damage lysosomal membrane and increase lipid oxidation. This can lead to permeabilization of the lysosomal membrane, leading to the escape of, of cathepsin B and activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome, as we talked about later, and generally impair the ability of lysosomes to remove the uh, oxidized lipids. This slide illustrates an important role that lysosomal calcium has in the function of lysosomes. We know that lysosomes are an important store for various molecules, calcium, ATP, and cytokines. Lysosomes are the second largest store of calcium inside the cell outside of the ER. Efflux of calcium through TRIPML1 channels can dictate many of the lysosomal functions depending on the particular calcium sensor closest to the channel. For example, on the top left, we see a diagram illustrating how movement of calcium out of the lysosome into synaptotagmin 7 can lead to fusion of the lysosome with the plasma membrane and exocytosis of lysosomal contents. This is analogous to the fusion of the synaptic vesicle with the synaptic membrane. On the bottom left, uh, the diagram illustrates important functions of lysosomal fusion with the plasma membrane. Of particular relevance to AMD is the role of this lysosomal fusion in phagocytosis and has been shown in some cells to be an important component of providing necessary membrane uh, for engulfing the uh, material to be phagocytosed. Patching of the membrane with elements of lysosomal membrane has also been shown to be critical in maintenance of, of certain cell types. Finally, the lysosomes store various transmitters and compounds, and so the secretion of these elements is dependent on fusion of this lysosomal enzyme with the plasma membrane. And again, these are all dependent on the efflux of lysosomal calcium through TRIPML1 and fusion of synaptotagmin 7 with the plasma membrane. This slide illustrates some of the newly discovered and I think pretty exciting new functions attributed to calcium efflux from the TRIPML1 channel and how this can impact cellular functions with bearing for RPE cells in AMD. In the top left, we see illustrated the role of TRIPML1 in allowing fusion of lysosomes with the plasma membrane. This is similar to what we saw in the previous slide and emphasizes the importance of this in removing lysosomal content, clearance particularly of lipids through this pathway, membrane repair, and perhaps even the phagocytosis. In the bottom left panel, we see a variant of this need of lysosomal calcium for membrane fusion as illustrated in the fusion between lysosomes and autophagosomes. This allows the final stage of autophagy uh, to proceed. We also see a role for this in changes in lysosomal membrane and reformation in the tubules on the left.
On the top right, we see a newly identified role for calcium efflux in regulating the transcription factor TFEV. By interacting with calmodulin and calcium neuron, uh, the effluxed calcium leads the TFEB to the nucleus. As previously discussed, TFEB plays a critical role in transcriptionally activating uh, the genes for proteins related to lysosomal biogenesis, but also many of the autophagy related genes are regulated to FEB and also some mitochondrial related genes. So this ability to allow calcium efflux has an important role for regulating autophagy in general. Finally, in the bottom right, we see a new function of calcium efflux through TRIPML1 binding to uh, the calcium sensor ALG2 and initiating dynein-mediated trafficking along microtubules towards the nucleus. It's clear that the differential placement of various calcium sensors, whether they are the ALG2, the calmodulin calcium neuron, the synaptotagmin 7, will determine which of these functions predominates uh, with the lysosome. And I've added a, a final cartoon on the right here just to really emphasize the importance of these functions, particularly in the ability of the lysosome to get rid of uh, waste, non-degraded waste, as you can see in the blue blobs there. Uh, and this efflux of calcium through TRIPML1 is really critical in allowing these lysosomes to fuse with the plasma membrane and get rid of this waste. And again, you see also illustrated there the need for this in the, um, in the activation of the TFEB transcription pathway. We've looked specifically at, at the question of whether or not the TRIPML1 channel has impaired function in models of retinal degeneration. In this case, looking at RPE cells from the ABCA4 knockout mouse model of Stargardt's retinal degeneration. On the top left panel, we see levels of cytoplasmic calcium uh, that are elevated in response to activating the TRIPML1 channel with specific agonist MLSA1. We can see in control cells, uh, this agonist leads to a clear release of calcium from lysosomes into the cell. This response is missing in RPE cells from the ABCA4 knockout mouse. You can see that quantified on the right panel with the red bars. Clearly, there is much less release of calcium from these lysosomes in these ABCA4 cells. To control, we did a measure of the expression of TRIPML1, and this trends towards being increased. It's not significant, uh, but clearly we cannot attribute the reduced release of calcium to changes in TRIPML1 expression. We also looked at the release of total lysosomal calcium by rupturing cal these lysosomes with a drug called GPN. And again, it seems like there are similar levels of lysosomal calcium in these cells. So we think this is a direct effect of material inside the lysosomes interacting with TRIPML1. This has been suggested to occur in other models of lysosomal storage disease. And so just to illustrate this implications on, on the right hand side, we predict that in a healthy cell, uh, the function of TRIPML1 will allow fusion of these lysosomes with the plasma membrane and the exocytosis of lipid waste. If the TRIPML1 channel is impaired, we will no longer expect uh, the fusion of these lysosomes with the plasma membrane and the efflux of lysosomal waste. So when we look at these cells that are chock full of lipofusin, we wonder whether this does not just reflect uh, 
increased accumulation, but perhaps this reflects the inability to exocytose the waste. Perhaps uh, impaired TRPML1 function could also lead to impaired phagocytosis in these. And there is a whole series of questions that need to be pursued and expanded as to whether or not lack of function of this important channel can have implications in AMD. I'd like to conclude my portion of this tutorial with this stunning set of images from a paper from 1987 uh, in which it examines the pathway for removal of material in the frog. And I think as a community, we spend an awful lot of time thinking about how do we get this material into RPE cells, the phagocytosis and the autophagy pathways, but very little thinking about how do we get rid of this waste. And given the importance of drusen in AMD, I think maybe it's time for us to spend a little bit more time thinking about how we get rid of this waste. And I've, I've quoted big sections of this paper. I'd encourage all of you to read it because I think the detail at which they've examined this is really beneficial to us all. But in these studies, they're looking at extrusion of, of vast amounts of waste of phagocytos, tips of photoreceptor outer segments, and how the material is exocytosed on the basolateral side of the RPE leads to massive accumulations within the, the collagenous zone, and it lines up with endothelial cells to get rid of it, an active role of endothelial cells guiding the fragments through the lumen into the capillary. And I think that this is fascinating on a lot of levels, uh, but I think given what we now know all these years later about the pathology of AMD, this provides an important set of observations that we can test with our new tools. For example, I would like to know whether the lysosomal exocytosis involving TRPML1 that we are now just learning about has a role to play in this process in RPE cells. So I would like to summarize. So finally, I'd just like to briefly summarize some of the key points of my portion of this tutorial. Uh, I've tried to present evidence that the lysosomes are critical in, in the degradation of material derived through both autophagy and, and through the phagocytosis of outer segments, and that it is the degradation of the lipids that I think is most problematic. Uh, not only because they don't have proteasomes to, to help with overflow, but because of the presence of iron and the oxidation of these lipids can create additional issues. That the lysosomes and mitochondria exist in a mutual support system, and so damage to one can lead to damage to the other. There is a particular danger when we get leaky lysosomes in that the efflux of cathepsin B can activate the NLRP3 inflammasome. I hope I've been able to share my enthusiasm uh, for the efflux of lysosomal calcium, particularly through TRPML1 and the role this plays in exocytosis, phagocytosis, fusion, organelle trafficking. And importantly, that this channel may be blocked by lipofusin in ABCA4 knockout RPE cells. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.